Hello there. Hello. Good evening. Hello from Memmingen in Germany. Hello, Robert. How are you today? Hi, Martin. How are you? Well, I'm, thanks. I'm good. Great to have you here. Uh, my pleasure to be here. We're at 70 something people right now here in the and joining us tonight, or um, it's, um, I think it's, it's uh, lunchtime on the East Coast, and it's almost dinner time here in Germany and the UK. Glad you're here. Just uh, post your questions in the chat box and let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, glad you're here. Uh, we have a very, very special guest here today, uh, one of Northern Ireland's foremost capacities in the field of natural history, Robert Thompson. <laughs> Uh, Robert is a professional natural history photographer, um, a specialist in close-up and macro photography in the UK. He has been widely published in the UK, Ireland, and uh, internationally. Uh, he appeared on TV and radio and is here today for the first time as a webinar host. So today is a first for him. Yeah, Robert, no. are you nervous? <laughs> Not too bad, no. 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 Okay. Awesome. Um, well, Robert, uh, as you as you notice, he's a great guy who came in contact with us uh, pretty late, and since then has given us uh, insight into his work, um, as well as providing uh, tips and tricks. Uh, I think Robert, we know each other since early 2020. Is that is that right? Yeah. Right. Right. At the when you very first reached out to us, right? Yeah. yeah. That, that's correct, yes. So pretty much the beginning of the current pandemic. Yeah. Um, before we met, um, Robert, you, you own several different tripods, and which you have since replaced um, with our triopod, modular tripods. And you, I think you're swapping legs and spiders back and forth. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's what you're telling me. Yeah, I, I'll speak a little bit about this um, later mm -hmm. on and my conversion to uh, Novaflex. Okay, so uh, people, um, if you want to dive deeper into uh, Robert's work, um, right after this presentation, uh, just visit his website at uh, robertthompsonphotography.com. Uh, it is filled with amazing uh, images, reviews, and uh, behind the spot profiles that Robert created, which are very uh, interesting to read. And um, another interesting topic about Robert, uh, like myself, he's also a fan of historic K-dramas. <laughs> um, on Netflix, and yeah. um, among many other topics, we regularly uh, speak about the latest shows as well. <laughs> and um, today, Robert, we we are looking forward to learn from you and to gain a deeper insight into your work and your photographic approach. So I would say, uh, without further ado, um, the stage is yours. Okay, Martin, thanks. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to say vielen Dank and Novaflex für die Einladen. Um, and my thanks to um, uh, everyone uh, who's going to join the webinar. And my thanks uh, for Matt, who is in the background, who is looking after everything um, on the technical side. Um, I suppose, in a way, um, where I would like to start is um, at the beginning. Um, for me, uh, I've always been interested in natural history from a child. Um, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a, in a large Parkland estate and it had a 105 acre lake. So I, I was surrounded in wildlife from birds to insects, all manner of creatures. Um, so from nine or 10 years old, I developed that interest. Um, <clears throat> and that interest has stayed with me. Um, I went to London, continued my studies over there. And when I finished, um, I came back. Um, and I was lucky at that particular time to um, get involved with the university uh, in Belfast on a project looking at mayflies. Um, it was a group of insects that very little was known about in Northern Ireland. And that's really where I had my um, first experience of photography, I realized that there were so few pictures um, of these insects that um, I decided that I would um, give it some time and uh, build a collection myself. This is one of the very first pictures I ever took um, and it's 30 years old. And if I told you that I took it 
with a Pentex LX, uh, I had a standard lens, which I reversed. I cut a hole out of the uh, body cap. I got myself a piece of black uh, drain pipe and I taped the lens in reverse to the front um, and the body cap to the back. And I used stop down meter in and a flash uh, gun. And this was the result. And that picture was taken um, 30 years ago. And that really was the turning point for me. Um, I became focused on photography in a lot of the natural history um, work that I did. Um, I always had an interest in dragonflies. So as a child living in the Parkland estate, there were hundreds during the late spring and summer, and I was always intrigued with them. And I maintained that interest um, really right from childhood, right through my adult life. Um, here we're looking at the um, Harry Hawker. Um, its Latin name is Brachyton pretensi. Dragonflies for me are a fascinating group of insects to photograph. They're challenging. Um, they're not easy um, insects to get close to. They've got 360 degree vision. They can fly forwards, backwards, and particularly the larger insects are much more difficult to get in close. So for the majority of, of my photography, um, I tend to shoot dragonflies with longer lenses and extension tubes. This shot was taken with a 300, uh, Nikon 300 2.8 with extension tubes. Um, it gives you a good working distance. And I find also when you, you get opportunities um, to photograph these insects, it keeps the background clutter free and you get this nice diffused um, appearance. Um, I'm particularly careful um, about dragonflies in the way that I photograph them. I look for subjects um, that are quite often isolated and um, the background is, is you know, in a distance behind them. Um, that's the type of images that I prefer to shoot. Um, so quite often it's a question of, I will photograph early in the morning and also in the evening time. Um, I'd rarely chase these insects um, during the middle of the day. But um, I was lucky enough um, about 20 years ago, the government in the Republic of Ireland uh, approached me about doing a high profile project and that was right up my street. I mean, here was a group of insects that I had a passion for and it was linked to a recording program um, and it was the first ever of its kind in Ireland and it led to a huge publication um, at the end of the study. And um, I owe a lot of my photographic career basically um, to that first project in Dragonflies. I also, uh, in these sort of days, like to try where possible and, and, and shoot wide angle macro. It's become a very popular subject uh, in the last sort of several years. Lao brought out a lens, um, a 15 millimeter wide angle macro, which um, is a great lens and it allows you the opportunity to get in very, very close, um, but you're also including the habitat, which now becomes equally important. When you're using a long lens, you're diffusing the background. When you're shooting wide angle macro, you have to pay attention to the background. The key is obviously to find the subjects. And then of course, you've got to find um, them in a situation where the background is actually complementing them and not um, a distraction. So um, this is why I find this kind of photography a lot more challenging. And being a natural history, photographer with a natural history background. It's the natural images that actually interest me. Um, I'm not interested in the manipulation of nature. I like to photograph it as it is. Um, another part of um, my work, which is important to me, is obviously GPS. So every image I shoot has GPS, and you'll see later on in the webinar you know, why that, that is. So basically the first part of the webinar is about me as a photographer and the type of subjects that I photograph um, in between doing a lot of my other routine natural history um, photography. The second part of the webinar is me actually explaining about some of the Novaflex equipment that I currently use in my, in my workflow. 
Um, butterflies is a big uh, passion of mine as well. And again, leading on from the Dragonfly project, um, we then uh, were able to approach the governments again, in, both in the Republic and Northern Ireland, and, and, and look at um, recording and photographic projects based around butterflies and moths. So again, for me, butterflies, um, I've traveled over Europe. Um, I've photographed many species in many different countries. Um, I find at the end of the day that when I started into natural history photography, there wasn't the same um, availability of many of uh, these particular insects. So for me, that worked extremely well. And um, I moved on very, very quickly from 35 millimeter to medium format. And that became my um, camera system, both the 645 Mamia and the RZ 6x7. Those were the two systems I used for a good part of my early photographic career. And then when digital got a hold uh, and I felt that it was good enough, uh, I switched to Nikon. And I have remained with Nikon for over 20 years. Uh, their equipment is superb. I have never had any inclination to uh, move to another system. Let's be honest, like these days, um, cameras are so good um, from all of the companies. There are no bad cameras. Um, but I think as photographers, the problem that we have today is we expect camera companies to produce cameras that are virtually flawless that will do every single thing for us um, from high speed and very fast autofocus but actually how did we manage um, all those years ago with relatively modest autofocus and, and you know there were amazing images that, that were taken then this is a picture from one of my workshops in Europe um, this European swallowtail so again I'm using um, a long lens here and keeping the, uh, the background nicely diffused I took a big interest um, not only in butterflies but in moths. Moths are the poor relations really of, of butterflies. They don't get the same attention. Um, yet scientifically there's no difference between them. Um, there are a lot more moths. Uh, certainly if you look in the, in, the, in the British Isles, there are a lot more moths that fly in the daytime than there actually are species of butterfly um, in the British Isles. There's over 180,000 species of moths that have been identified and documented. Um, I call them nature's nocturnal butterflies. And I've devoted a lot of my photographic career in between other um, photographic work in documenting and photographing these um, amazing insects from all over Europe and, um, and different parts of the world. Um, this is the silver striped hawk moth, which um, is a lot more common in Europe and quite quite rare uh, in the British Isles. But again, you'll notice that this is actually shot with a 200 uh, millimeter macro, which Nikon brought out in 1994. And much to my disappointment, they have never actually replaced it. The 105 is at three or four different updates. Uh, and recently the, Z, the new Z105 is, is a superb lens, but unfortunately they've neglected this which I consider to be an extremely important macro lens. And many macro photographers actually use, still use this lens today. And moths, of course, are extremely diverse. They come in all shapes and sizes. Um, I think that's what I find so fascinating. And when you look at their, their, their natural history, a lot of them have developed, you know, devised over evolution all sort of shapes, sizes, colors, and patterns. And here you can see the scarce Merveille du Jour, which is quite a rare moth. Um, how it blends naturally with the lichens um, on, tree, on tree trunks. And that's where it's, where it's happy. Its pattern reflects that evolutionary trail. Um, and to be honest, um, I find them much more fascinating and interesting than, than butterflies. Um, I also over 20 years ago, developed an interest in Saturnid moths. Now, they are really the, they're absolutely fantastic uh, insects. Some of them have wingspans of up to 16 centimeters. Um, I've been lucky enough to work with different professional entomologists and universities from Europe um, on these moths. And I've accumulated over a 20 year period, many species 
Um, some of uh, some of them I photographed in situ in the wild, and others um, have come from South America and places like that. Some of them have rarely been photographed, and scientifically, I have been documenting these for a long period of time, uh, with the view that we will publish a comprehensive book, hopefully, maybe in the not too distant future. They're extremely nervous moths, so again, you have to be very, very careful. And particularly those, like this is the African moon moth. Uh, it's an amazing species, but very a, a nervous moth. You can see it's got very long tails, and these can easily be damaged. Um, but I, I find them absolutely um, fascinating. And in my in my spare time, and when I have free time, I devote a lot of my um, photographic time to um, particularly butterflies and moths. I also have to cover um, plants uh, routinely as well, on contracts sometimes. And um, when I travel throughout Europe and different places, I run photographic workshops. Um, and um, I'm always accumulating many different types of images. I have a big interest in orchids. Um, I, again, I've collaborated both north and south of the border. And um, I've co-authored a book as well on orchids as I've done on butterflies and moths and dragonflies too. Um, I suppose, again, I apply the same sort of principle. I don't often photograph plants in close up with short um, focal length macros, um, even the 105. I am a person who likes the pictorial aspect to an image. And just because a plant is static, you get a lot of people who think there isn't a challenge in, in, in plant photography. Actually, you can be further from the truth. It requires a lot more skill um, looking and deciding which plant is in the best position, what the background is like behind it. Um, and one of my favorite techniques is, again, long lenses, anywhere between a three and a 500 mil extension tubes and I like to shoot low down so that I can allow the foreground foliage to blur. Um, so I'm always looking for those creative um, opportunities and these are just typical examples um, of the type of imagery of flowers that I personally like to photograph. Um, previous image was a pyramidal orchid and, and this is a wood anemone. Again, shot with a very long lens, um, and I've just allowed the foreground there to blur. Um, these are the most pictorial type of images for me. Um, I do a lot of aquatic uh, photography. Um, a lot of photographers in the macro world tend to avoid this. Um, it, is a it is very time consuming. It requires a lot of planning in advance. Um, and a number of years ago, um, in one of my earlier books, I illustrated um, a setup that I developed. It's all worked from a single clamp, and you've got a T connection at the top, um, which allows me to put flexible um, goosenecks, um, and then I can attach flash guns as well as one in the center. So I can set this up very, very quickly beside a river or a rock pool, and I have an assortment of different uh, tanks depending on what I'm doing but the beauty and the advantage of, of of this type of work is I can use the water from the river I can filter it it's at the same temperature the subject is going to be not stressed in the same way that it would be if you tried to do it in the studio I can use the natural substrate from the river to create the background and most importantly at the end when I've done all that I can um, release the subject back into its environment. Um, and this is the way that I shoot virtually all um, of my aquatic um, photographs. Typically, dragonflies is, is, is something that I've covered quite a lot. I, I've, I've photographed every single British species of dragonfly in their larval form. Um, and this is a common hawker, and it's done exactly in the same technique as I've just described previously. It also allows me to work with more sensitive uh, creatures in the same way. Um, crayfish in, in Ireland as a whole are rare and they're protected. So being able to work at a stream where they actually occur, create the, the, 
the, the substrate, build the habitat, and then introduce your subject. Um, it, it's it's a much quicker process, I find, and um, I, I just simply put the, the creature back into its own environment. Um, in these situations, I use just use flash. It's just simple, quick, uh, and it saves any hassle. I also do a lot of coastal photography at rock pools, and that is one of the most challenging areas, obviously, because you're working against the tide, the general weather conditions, um, finding the right type of subject. And in this example here, th this is why um, I really like the NovaFlex approach. This is the Pro 75. I can virtually put it at any angle that I choose. Um, you can see where the circle is highlighted. There's a, a tiny little cleft in the rock there, and there's a pool. Uh, there are anemones. The elegant anemones are in there. So I can set this up, and then all I have to do is use the flash, um, and uh, this is the result. Um, so um, when you're working in, in, in sort of rock pools where you're working against the tide, I find that this is by far the, the, the best approach. Sometimes working directly into a rock pool um, where the surface is ripping and due to wind um, can be problematic. Um, I get around that simply by utilizing the same technique as I did at the river. Um, I am able to use the appropriate tank very, very close uh, to the shoreline, or I can, if I can get my Jeep as close as possible, I can place the tank in, in my Jeep create the set from the, the natural materials that are there, introduce the subject, um, and then um, return it back. Um, and particularly with marine um, creatures, uh, this is really important. They're highly sensitive to changes, um, not only in water temperature, um, but um, when they're out of their natural environment. Um, so I find that this works quickly. The creatures look naturally. This is a common prawn, and again, it's just it's shot, it's just photographed using straight flash. Um, long spine sea scorpion again, utilizing um, the same technique. And of course, you know, marine mollusks uh, or nullibranchs, as they're called, uh, are, are beautiful creatures. You get some of the species occur in rock pools. Their land equivalents are snails and snug, slugs. I suppose people don't find them as attractive, but certainly their marine cousins um, come in many different shapes, sizes, and colors. They're very, very attractive creatures um, to photograph. And again, it's done exactly the same way. I call this pushing the boundaries quite simply because um, I think every photographer, um, no matter what their routine photography is are always thinking about ideas and projects and something a wee bit different um, and it's the same for me as well um, two photographers that greatly influenced I suppose my my photography in the early days was Stephen Dalton who was based in the UK but had a worldwide reputation he was a pioneer of high-speed flash photography his photo photographs really um, in the 70s uh, and 80s and even before that were truly amazing. And I was always inspired just by the amount of time, effort and attention to detail that, that Stephen um, put into his images. I, I was lucky enough to um, eventually be accepted into his agency. And I think at that time I was one of the youngest photographers and I got to know him. He very kindly wrote the foreword in one of my first photography books, um, which I was extremely um, honored that he did. Um, and I suppose in a way, a lot of my style has been over the years developed as a result of the inspirational work that he did. And also an American photographer called John Shaw. They were the only two authors I ever ordered books in advance because I knew every single publication that these photographers would actually produce would be outstanding. And bear in mind, they were all working with film, um, which at times could be a lot more challenging than you know digital today. Um, so John Shaw was a remarkable photographer. Um, I think he was based in Colorado in America. 
and his books were certainly you know really inspirational uh, as well and both those photographers had a big impact big impact on the type of work that i did so i was asked could i produce photographs of a frog diving into water um i thought it was possible but i couldn't do it conventionally so with all these projects, it's a question of working everything out in advance and how you can create the situation um, to make it actually happen. Um, so obviously, in, you know, this had to be done in the studio uh, tank. I used an infrared beam, which was connected to the camera, uh, a large rock that's set above uh, the, the tank. Um, and basically, it was a question then of collecting the frogs. I live close to a river, so I collected several frogs. Um, one or two were very accommodating and, and jumped many times. Some of the others jumped once and just totally refused after that. So that's the kind of thing you were up against. But the problem is when they actually dove, sort of div off the rock um, into the water, they could interrupt the beam in any particular area. So some could be partially in focus. Um, one could be completely in focus. Unfortunately, its legs may have sort of be out of the frame. Um, so it's a question of refinement and, you know, making adjustments and basically perseverance. And two and a half days later, 300 uh, images later, this is the shot that I, that I had in mind. Um, and it's like all projects it, it it requires time patience and constantly looking um at ways that you can refine that process and encourage the creature then to go exactly where you want it to go um utilizing the same concept i was sitting in my patio um one summer afternoon and i was just watching all the different wasps that were sort of accumulating around the fuchsia and I came up with the idea it would be quite nice to do a flight shot. Um, problem is, how do you uh, sort of confine the wasps to just going to one flower? So again, it's the planning and the process. And um, for me, uh, what I simply did was tie some of the other branches back, bag the flowers, set up the infrared beam, camera, everything in position. And I worked on this on and off for a couple of days. But the secret ingredient that actually made the difference was I used a sugar solution and lightly spread it onto the flower. And that really did attract the wasp. So it's a question of it interrupting the beam exactly in, in the correct position. And because it's macro and it's close up, a millimeter is a mile out in this case. So um, you've got to be prepared for quite a lot of um, failures. But eventually, um, I did get several shots. This was just one that were in my opinion, very acceptable. And then I got a project like this where I was asked by uh, a conservation organization in Northern Ireland um, who were producing a, a large scale pro poster. And they had baby long-eared owls um, on their reserve. The problem was they were about 35 feet up in the tree. Um, so photographing them from the ground was, was out of the question. <clears throat> Building a hide was also out of the question because it wasn't that far from a main road and there were public housing not that far away. So that would have attracted attention and it just simply wasn't feasible. So again, it's, it's the planning and how you might tackle something like this is the key to it. The camera is the last link in the chain. It's the means by which you capture that visualization. It's, it's, it's not the important part at that stage. So there were trees that were pretty close um, to where the nest was. And um, I came up with the idea and I, I got two foot long square sticks that were about three inches square. And I created a ladder just like rungs up an adjacent tree trunk. So I would actually be able to climb up the, the trunk of the tree. Uh, I had a safety rope around me and I put two planks across branches that were virtually nearly at eye level to the eyelets. Um, all I needed to place on that was a bean bag. 
So then I could back up with the camera slung around um, my shoulder and uh, a powerful flash in it. Camera long lens on the bean bag, and and that's how the shot was done. And then it was done quickly, and I was able then to remove the rungs that I created on the tree trunk, and uh, there was no sign uh, of anything then that was left behind. So it, it comes down basically to, in my opinion, thinking about projects, thinking about how best to um, approach them. Um, the National Trust own many properties in Northern Ireland. Uh, in Fermanagh, they asked me, would it be possible to get a shot of one of their own grebes uh, on uh, the lock shore? Um, they didn't want a shot of just the grebe on the water. They specifically wanted it on the nest, and they wanted it in profile. <laughs> Not a just a bit of a tall order, but um, with a little bit of field work, we managed to find out of several nests, one that... The platform was not too far out and not in too deep a water. So what we did was over a period of three days, we built a reed screen in the same Phragmites reeds and left it for a week. Um, I was going to obviously have to get in on a wetsuit. So um, I already tried an adjacent area and the water was just up to my waist. So <clears throat> there wasn't really going to be a problem there. So we let it sit for a week. We came back. The problem was Ireland gets a lot of rain at times. So when we got back, the water level had risen. And I'm not that, you know, I'm not six feet tall. So the water line now moved from my waist to virtually the top of my chest. And I had to stand for two and a half hours at a time in the cold water. And the tripod and camera was just about 30 centimeters above the water line. And for two days, most of the time, the bird looked directly at me. And it was only just very occasionally it sat in profile. And at the end, that's that's how the shot was was got. Um, Ireland has um, many different islands uh, around it. And, and during the, the late spring and summer, you get a huge influx of seabirds that nest on these islands. I've run workshops for over 20 years. Um, photographing seabirds um i never tire of photographing them or just spending time in amazement just looking at them gannets obviously are, are a big catch for for many people and um i have photographed them hundreds of times over those years but again i'm always looking for those pictures that i think are just that little bit special uh, and this is one for me that i took some time ago that still remains one of my um, favorite pictures it's taken in the, the late evening um, taken with the long lens obviously and um, I just like the overall ambience of the image and the pair together and um, we've all done flight shots of gannets many photographers that's one of the first things they want to do um, and we all own hundreds I mean I, I have thousands of pictures over the years of them but again, as a natural history photographer, I'm always looking for something just more than a flight shot and a plain blue sky. And in an incoming tide here, um, I noticed that some birds occasionally were flying between the rocks and the waves were lashing off uh, the rocks. So the following evening, I came back with a big lens and I spent most of the evening just waiting um, for the occasional bird to fly between sort of the incoming tide and the waves splashing and the rock. And um, persistence paid off and I managed to get uh, several nice images where the bird was just exactly where I wanted it. And again, it's a, it's a picture that not only shows the bird in flight, but shows the habitat around it and, and the conditions at the time. These are the types of pictures that, that basically interest me. Um, Moving on to, to projects again, um, the dragonfly project, the butterflies and moth, the orchid projects that were national projects within Ireland um, were a great stepping stone for me and they proved to be very, very successful. This was the most ambitious one um, that I had to date, which was the natural history of Ulster. Ulster, some of its counties lie in Northern Ireland and the UK, for those that aren't familiar. And some of the counties are also in the Republic of Ireland, but it is classified as the province of Ulster. So I approached um, 
Dublin and Belfast, and they agreed. Uh, nothing like this had ever been done before. Um, where a natural history of a province from its formation and its de- geological structure of its landscape, how the people um, over hundreds of years have influenced the landscape, and of course, all the many different aspects of its wildlife. So um, this was an extremely expensive project, um, but we got the go ahead to do it. It took five years um, to do, 600 pages, over 600 photographs. Um, And uh, what I wanted to do was I didn't simply... um, It's a heavy one, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) I have it here. It's uh, it's good for keeping doors open. Um, (laughs) So... um, I didn't want to do probably what other photographers and myself have done many times is go to well-known areas and put your tripod in the same spots as you've done previously. I thought about let's try and show the landscape from the air. In a lot of situations, it's never been done and allow the public to see, you know, the province of Ulster in a way that's not really been illustrated. So it took a lot of planning, and basically to cut a long story short, um, they agreed to it. So we we chartered a helicopter company that normally flies television crews um, all over the UK. Um, It had to be done in a very safe way. Um, And we got PDG helicopters, who are professional pilots. If you're you're not fond of heights, that this is not for you. Um, I had a crash course for a day on health and safety uh, and an emergency what to do. Um, also, the doors are removed for photography. So when the helicopter banks and things like that, you know, um, it can be quite nerve wracking. Um, but nevertheless, I, I don't have a fear of heights, so it wasn't a problem. Um, learning to speak and communicate to the pilot, knowing the elevation that you needed in order to get the shot where the helicopter needed to be. You also had to file a flight plan two days prior to flying. I also had to book the helicopter um, six weeks in advance and confirm 48 hours prior to flying from Scotland. Every time it took off from Scotland, it was £2,000 to start. The whole project at the end, just for the aerial photography, was over £25,000. But this is actually the full image of the front cover, but it, it shows the landscape in a way that was just, for me, simply outstanding. And over a period of a year, um, we flew in all sorts of weather. We covered virtually every island. We flew out over nine, ten miles out into the Atlantic to make sure that we got as much as we could. Um, and it was an amazing experience. Um, I would say the one thing that I did learn from it, um, which they didn't teach me on the on the, on the one day course, was um, you must not drink water. You must stop drinking water the day before. Um, and of course, I was on my way down to the airport, drinking out of a bottle of water, not thinking. And of course, once you go up, um, in forty-five minutes, my kidneys were bladder were absolutely squealing. Um, and between the vibration of the helicopter and the cold, pilots not normally allowed to land outside the flight plan, path or the designated areas. And I had a young pilot, and he was very sympathetic, and he. he he dropped it quickly behind the mountain and gave me five minutes. Uh, but I learned afterwards not to do that. Um, so um, it was an amazing experience. And, you know, w- when you look at northwest Donegal, I mean, Donegal is a, a large number of sea locks. But to actually be able to photograph them um, from the air, um, some of the work was shot with the D3 and, and other Nikon cameras. Um, takes on a whole, the landscape takes on a whole new concept for me. And during that time, I, I really did enjoy it. And subsequently after that, I, I did other aerial commissions. Drones are used now, of course. And um, the problem with drones is um, there are just simply situations and places that you cannot use them. And a camera from a helicopter is still uh, the best way to do it. This is Trebega Bay. It's It's one of the most famous sea locks in, in Donegal. 
the tide is out, but you can still see the flow on the water uh, in the deep areas. That's the channel that um, the water comes in, you know, when when the tide comes in. So um, an amazing, like, you know, experience during that time. Um, photographing a lot of the islands was also um, quite challenging. Um, I'm up about a, just over a thousand feet here. It's about 10 miles out into the Atlantic. And this is Inish Trull, and it's the most northerly island in Ireland. So really, it's the most northerly point in Ireland um, in terms of its geography. It's got an interesting history as well because the the island itself, the rock on the island is amongst the oldest. It's 1.7 billion years old. The lighthouse um, was manned, I think, right up until the 1980s. It's now automated. And people actually lived on this island, I think, right up until the late 1920s. You can see the old schoolhouse at the back of the lighthouse. And it's it's uninhabited now, so um, it's not that easy to reach. But working from a helicopter gives you the opportunity and the positions, you know, that you can get into to be able to shoot high resolution imagery of of places like this. So um, that's just a little bit about some of my photography, my style, um, my approach. Um, I think, like many photographers. Um, Throughout the years, I bought bits and pieces of equipment. Um, I tried to make them work together. If I couldn't, I designed equipment um, to make the process easier. Um, of course, I knew about Novaflex. Um, I admit at the time, not you know, even in some of my earlier photography publications, um, not as much. Um, I have to say, I regret that in some aspects because. Um, since I've bought into the concept of, of using Novaflex equipment, it, in many ways it's transformed a lot of my photography and some of the things that I do. Um, this is um, some of my uh, equipment that I use regularly in my um, workflow. Um, Magic Ball here is one of my favorite ball heads. There, in my opinion, there is nothing that comes close to it. Um, the um, versatility that that head has uh, is is far greater than any uh, ball and socket head that's currently available. I also use the Classic Ball 5.2 and um, the Classic Ball 3.2. And the beauty about those heads is they've got additional drop slots, so you immediately have more um, positional um, ability with, with both these tri um, ball heads. The other really, really important thing as well is you have um, precise friction control, preset friction control, and that that for me is brilliant because I know when I put different types of lenses uh, or different setups on, I know precisely where, which number and which friction control that I need. That is something that you can't get in a conventional ball head. Um, it's very, very difficult to emulate exactly the same thing uh, each time. But having this, um, I, I think, is brilliant. And there's absolutely no creep I have found, no matter what setup I use, there are no creep whatsoever. Um, I'll talk a little a bit, a bit in a moment about those two tripods. Um, the Castle Micro, uh, I use a lot. The Bellows systems, both the Bal Pro one and, and the Bal F um, as well. Um, and every, everything about the Novaflex concept just works. It's been cleverly designed, cleverly thought out. Um, and you'll see just from some of the examples, um, uh, from, from my point of view as a photographer, um, I should have been using it sooner, to be perfectly honest. Having owned seven tripods, most of them individually are okay, but I never managed to get a tripod that um, would meet all of my needs. Um, and in every single photography book that I've ever written about, um, I've always included a chapter on tripods because um, of the importance of a tripod. And I think digitally, these days, a lot of photographers try to work without them. I've even had photographers um, come on some of my macro um, photography courses with no tripod. Um, can you believe it? Um, but they're happy to pump the ISO up and, and work differently. Um, that's not how I work. 
So the two tripods that I use frequently uh, in my routine photography is the Pro 7 5 and uh, the Triopod M. Um, um, I think the Triopod um, M came out in nine, uh, 2019, and I think it was 2017 when the uh, the Pro 7 5 came out. Martin will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that is correct. <laughs> that is correct. Precise dates. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you can see on the Pro 7 5 why I like it. You can look at this setup, and it's got everything from Novaflex from the top to the bottom. And why? Because everything fits perfectly. Um, there is no free play, no movement. Um, it's just superbly engineered. Um, one of the things I should point out is that um, the Arca Swiss style template is used by many different camera companies. And in fact, I have other ball and socket heads from other companies. Um, and each of them have their own slant on how they they interpret that sort of patent or when it was, you know, or that style. Um, which means sometimes when you use components from another um, manufacturer, which is Arca Swiss style, onto a different one, they're not completely compatible. The dovetails and the angulation is not quite right. Therefore, when you put a lot of heavier equipment on it, you can have mobility and instability. You won't find that. And I have, you will not find this with the Novaflex uh, equipment. Everything is precisely right down to the very L bracket. It's precisely milled, angulated, and everything just fits um, beautifully together. Um, that is one of the things that impresses me so much about both the, the, the whole system, from its tripods right through till its, its, its bellows. Everything just works together. Before I talk just about one or two other things, I mentioned about how important tripods are. Um, and I just thought it might be worth mentioning some of the key features um, for maybe some of you out there that are new to photography or new um, to macro and how, from my point of view, um, a tripod is so important. So one of the things it does is gives you compos compositional accuracy adjustments so it means when you frame uh, everything up it's it's 100 accurate each time um, when you use your eye and you handhold you're not uh, every shot that you take will be marginally different um, focus and sharpness you can pinpoint focus precisely where you want it each time and it will replicate that through each successive image um, you cannot do that when you handhold Sharpness goes without saying. If it's on a tripod, it's always going to be sharper. And then those compositional sort of difficulties where you're photographing things in a in a difficult situation, having it trying to handhold something and twist your your body into a, a, a strange position just so that you can see doesn't really work very well. That's where a tripod again has a huge advantage. Complete range of shutter speeds and aperture selection, of course. You can choose to use anything that you want. You're restricted to maybe perhaps certain apertures, higher ISO uh, when you're hand holding something. I think if you're seriously interested in macro photography, particularly working at higher magnifications, then it, it's an absolute must. And of course, you can use the camera's optimum ISO setting um, because it's supported on a tripod. And and importantly as well, lastly, you've got freedom from the viewfinder. So um, you don't have to constantly keep your eye to the viewfinder and you can look and assess the, competition, the composition visually um, rather than having to keep your eye uh, pinned to the viewfinder all the time. So the Novaflex system, the, the versatility of it. I, I carry um, all my tripod legs and all the various bits of equipment um, in the bag in my Jeep. So whatever photographic situation I'm sort of doing and when I arrive, I, I can decide what is the best configuration for me, whether I need to use the Pro 7 5, use shorter legs or legs from um, the Triopod M. The beauty about the system is no matter what type of photography that you're undertaking, 
everything is interchangeable. And that is the beauty about it. You don't need your seven tripods and carrying two or three with you to do different jobs. You can just build the configuration that you need to do the particular job. And for me, that uh, was a game changer. So it certainly eliminates the need for multiple tripods. Um, the tripods, the spider base, which is the main component on the on each of the tripod um, tripods, is superbly engineered. Um, it will take any combination of legs, both long, short combination of both. And we'll talk a wee bit about that later. How I use that, um, but having the interchangeability is where the innovation comes in. And the one thing I will say about Novaflex, and I'm not paid by them, I use their equipment. They've invited me to speak, and I am being honest and speaking frankly about the equipment, is they think outside the box. There's no other company um, that I can think of that either manufacture tripods that have actually come up with this concept where you can mix and match. Um, and for me, this is an absolute game changer. So I can adjust, I can put whatever I need on a particular spider base. If I'm using rails, bellows, panel bases, L brackets, it all works seamlessly together. So um, last year, um, I uh, was um, testing the Z9. Um, <clears throat> and uh, when I go to the mountains, um, obviously lightness is a consideration that I have to take on board. When you're work on, w working sort of in those sort of sort of areas, you're often having to work long distances. So carrying a really heavy tripod for me is not practical. But this is where I frequently use the tripod M. And in this case, um, because that particular day in the mountains, the wind was quite severe and it was extremely cold. Um, I put the legs from the Pro 7.5, the larger legs on to give me that extra stability in the wind. I also use the Classic Ball 3 um, because it's that little bit lighter than the Classic Ball 5. And I attach a pano base and the whole lot just works seamlessly together. So. I have the ability to shoot straightforward imagery, um, which I did in this case. That's just a result from that particular um, spot. Um, and I can also shoot, when I'm in the mountains, I can also shoot panos, which is um, one of my um, favorite um, types of photography as well. So I have the combination of being able to shoot um, just regular, um, imagery or panoramic photography. Um, the tripod M is ideally balanced. It's not too light and it's not too heavy. And again, I can change the configuration depending on the day. Where I think the tripod M really does work incredibly well is for all of the routine macro photography that I do. Um, here is a typical example of just what I would call macro photography, um, most of it below life size. Um, that spider base um, with these uh, typical legs and the magic ball is my often preferred way of wor working um, when I'm having to walk about quite a lot and I'm away for quite a few hours at a time. So the flowers I'm actually photographing here are greater stitch work. So I am taking um, a typical portrait shot and then I carry um, the Castell XQ2 uh, focusing rack with me always as well because um, what I can do then if I want to focus stack or get a much closer image I have the facility to do that. Um, also I developed for some of you that may have my macro photography books you will see that I developed a, what's called a stem stabilizer and um, that I can attach to a delicate plant um, and that will help stabilize it while I go through the sequence um, when I'm focus stacking. Um, Ireland being an island, of course, there's no shortage of um, coastal locations. 
um, it, it does indeed have some truly amazing um, coastline. I always tend to use the Pro 7 5 um, in coastal locations quite simply because of its stability. I'm not usually having to carry it for miles on end. And another important factor is when you've got an incoming tide like this, the vibration um, of the waves as it hits the tripod legs, particularly if you're using neutral density filters and long exposures, can compromise your imagery. So this is why I frequently, even in my workshops, talk a lot about the importance um, of a tripod. Uh, by the way, these images, these prelim images are shot just with my iPhone. <laughs> The quality is not that good, but just so that you're aware. So this is typically how I um, would use um, the Pro 7.5, and that's just one of the results from that particular shoot on, on that evening. Um, tide comes in fast and um, well over these rocks. Um, the Atlantic can be quite strong, particularly on, on days where the wind is quite severe. I think that's why it's such an important thing to have a tripod that, you know, is as stable as possible. Um, this is probably without doubt one of the most photographed lighthouses um, in Ireland, Fannet Lighthouse. It sits on the Fannet Peninsula in northwest Donegal. Um, there's been a light in some shape or form on that peninsula for well over 200 years. And it's been modified and rebuilt over that period of time. It's a mega for photographers, um, I think quite simply because of its location and its overall pictorial quality. Um, many photographers like to go here when there's a storm, but I will point out it is an extremely dangerous um, place to be. Um, there have been many uh, serious injuries and fatalities um, at this lighthouse, um, particularly when you go to it when the weather conditions are severe. Um, that's obviously when you'll get really impressed pictures. Problem is there's a cleft and you've a very, very narrow, rocky sort of outcrop to walk across. Um, problem is if you slip at all um, there, you will certainly fall um, down onto the rocks below. And that's exactly what I think happened. I think it was about 2014, 15 was the last person, a photographer that I that I had heard of that had died. Uh, he'd been up there on a very, very stormy evening. So it's not without its dangers. And again, the winds are severe. Again, the incoming tide is coming in here, having the Pro 7.5 and it well supported in there. That's the way I like, I like to work. That's just one of the results from that particular shoot on that day. Um, <clears throat> I talked about if you had no head for heights. Well, if you're claustrophobic, uh, you will not like this type of photography either. Um, I've been commissioned twice to photograph the cave systems um, in the Marble Arch um, region. And um, the first time I did it was in 1995. Um, it's a very, very challenging place to work underground. Um, when you look at this image here, um, we've actually come through this passage um, just with our lights. All of your equipment has to be sealed up and protected from water. Um, generators, cables have to be dragged in. You've got to position lights um, and set each shot up individually. And you're obviously working uh, deep down, quite often wading through water. In this case, we have come a bit further on and we're on to a, a sort of a rocky outcrop where we were able to set uh, everything up <clears throat> in order to get the shot. Um, so it's a pretty challenging um, place to work. Um, in this shot here, um, I've keyholed the lighting in this large chamber. The cavers have actually um, descended down from the woodland above, um, which is about 50 meters and they wanted this type of imagery where they're abseiling down. Where the rope actually goes is very close to a huge drop. So um, it's a pretty dangerous um, place. We um, had to go a different way. They came down 
uh, we had to walk for about three quarters of a kilometer uh, and carry our equipment through to to do this type of uh, photography. Um, <clears throat> the guy in the picture here was one of the leaders and we had a team of um, cave experts and they were brilliant and they carried uh, generators and cables and helped set everything up. This type of photography is, is challenging and at times you're going into areas that are very, very narrow. Um, so I was a bit apprehensive initially, but um, I always like something different than a challenge and this certainly was. The guy in the image <clears throat> was terrific. Um, Caver, lots of experience, even though he was only 29 years old. And sadly, um, he died um, not long after I actually took this shot, um, which was um, a real tragedy. Then I heard uh, from time to time about a secret waterfall and cave in Donegal. And this intrigued a lot of people, but nobody knew actually where it was. Um, and then a couple of years ago, um, someone posted on the internet its location. Um, and lots of people then were interested in, in traveling um, to see this. The problem with it is um, it's actually um, in an area where the tide um, can come out I and mean, in very, very quickly. You've got about a two hour window um, and you've got to clamber over rocks and cliffs when the tide is out to get to the location. If you stay longer, um, what happens is the tide will come in and cut you off and you'll be trapped. And the tide actually, this is the length of the cave, the tide actually comes well up. You can see the marcation line here along the top when the tide comes in on a very high tide. So you really have to make sure that if you, get your imagery, you have to be out before uh, and make your way back um, along those rocks um, before the tide starts to come in. Otherwise, you'll just get trapped. Um, a little bit challenging to photograph because of the, the, the different exposure and light, you know, within the cave itself and the waterfall. So this was a composite image um, that I made uh, at the time. I'd like to go back to it again when there's more water. Um, and perhaps in the future I will. Um, the other, the other thing that I have a great passion for is waterfalls, um, and um, I do travel everywhere, um, photographing them when I can. And I photographed a lot in Europe, um, and in Iceland. Um, also, I've run a few workshops in Plitvis uh, in Croatia, which has uh, the national park. Um, which is superb for waterfalls in the autumn time. So um, whenever I can, I like to do this. Again, having the, ex the extra extension on, on you know, the Pro 7.5 and the long legs means when you're working at different elevations with rocks, um, it, it's much easier to position your tripod. And quite often the tripod is in the water itself. So at the end, you're dealing with... Um, the vibration and the water flow that's 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 coming through. Um, that's just one of the results from the waterfall just ahead that you saw there um, in that particular shoot. Um, <clears throat> last year, um, I was given a Z72 to test for a while, um, and on the first evening, actually taking it out, I have it here in the Pro 75 of the Magic Ball. Um, I went into a Bluebell Meadow just looking for um, subjects um, when I came across this green vein white that was um, resting on top of the bluebell. This is again shot with um, a 200 macro, again, keeping the background nicely diffused. Um, and this this is my, my favorite way of working. I like to think I am a pictorial photographer and I will look for subjects that create that sort of pictorial aspect and that ambience about um, about an image. Um, if it's not right and it doesn't fit my criteria, um, I tend not to photograph it unless I am specifically asked uh, to do so. But the camera, the camera is a superb camera um, and I used it for quite a while. Um, and um, 
before I obviously had access to the Z9. Um, but um, I think if there was no Z9, this certainly would be uh, the next best choice for me. And this is um, a shot just showing you, th this is my typical woodland setup when I don't have huge distances to walk. Um, I use the um, Pro 7.5 um, Magic Ball. Here I've got the Z9 and I'm actually photographing um, these uh, Scarlet Elf Cup fungi. You've got amazing stability here. Um, this is also the, the new Z105. I did this uh, some time ago. Um, and uh, it's my ideal kind of way of, of, of working. Um, so taking a conventional shot, um, you've got, you know, very, very good stability. So you get the ultimate, I think, in, in sharpness. Then um, when I want to look at slightly different, you know, more oblique angles of subjects, then I can take out the, um, the focusing rail, um, the XQ2, and then I can focus stack. And the beauty about that is because everything is so stable, um, you can you have a lot less in terms of artifacts um, when you come to focus, you know, combine all of the images together. And really, when you look at you know moss and the detail that's in it, stability is when you're focus stacking is for me absolutely critical. Um, so um, you do not want any movement at all in your equipment setup while you're um going through this, the stacking process um that's the reel i currently use it's superbly made it's solid i have a couple of reels um from other companies quite frankly this one does it for me one of the the, the unique aspects of the pro 75 for me which was a game changer is the ability to very very quickly um invert the tripod legs so that you can get your camera right down at ground level and companies advertise their tripod goes to ground level and yes it does <clears throat> but when you add a head onto that and in the camera itself you're you, you know you're not your your sensor is not you're not able to get your sensor parallel uh, at ground level with the subject um within a, a minute you can f quickly um, invert the legs on the Pro 7.5 and you've now got your camera right down um, at ground level. When I'm shooting plants and orchids, I frequently utilize the camera in this position. It, that is one of the things I really do like um, about the Pro 7.5. And here is the result from that, that image that I shot with my iPhone. And the beauty again is when you need to control background clutter being able to get your camera right down means you can increase the distance between the subject and your background and you can get uh, perhaps a better diffusion and that's exactly how um, i like to use the tripod in that uh, situation quite frequently one of the things um, that i didn't pay that much attention initially when i when i got the tripod was mini legs are I think Martin calls them drumsticks. Um, but actually, um, these are an amazing um, accessory to have. And as photographers, we all come across situations, particularly when we're using ultra wide angle lenses, where we just can't get the tripod legs in the position we want. And we end up, you know, sometimes having bits of the foreground uh, in our composition that we don't want. This is one of the great situations where two seconds removes a leg or two legs, you screw in the mini legs. Now you can get your camera right on top of the bridge, as in this case, um, and nothing is in, in the way. A situation like this is another um, spot that I find the mini legs indispensable. Sometimes you cannot just frame the subject the way you would like because one of the legs just gets in the way where the tree trunk is. Um, again, this shows a classic example of where removing the leg and replacing it with a mini leg. Um, there's a moth sitting on the tree trunk here. Um, allows me to get the camera in into a, a better a better position, and that is the the outcome. Um, 
So using the mini legs for me is a very, very useful accessory. Um, if I'm doing a lot of ground photography, it has a lot less impact on the surrounding vegetation if you're using the three mini legs. And in this case here, obviously, you can see on the back of the LCD screen um, the subject, and I've outlined it um, in the background there where, where I'm actually photographing. That in combination with the um, Classic Ball 5 is uh, an extremely um, stable setup um, and more than capable of holding the D850 here on the 200 uh, millimeter macro. That's the finished result. So um, here is another classic situation. I do a lot of lichen photography and often the tripod legs just become a bit of a nuisance. I'm trying to manipulate the camera into the ideal position. Here is a hybrid <clears throat> setup that works incredibly well. Too many legs uh, replace the main legs and I can still keep the other leg in the back. That prevents me from actually having to try and place the legs up in the air in each side of the rock. Um, so I, I find them just extremely useful in so many situations. Here's a situation again where I'm working on a rock face and it is just much easier to um, use the mini legs um, and uh, without having to use the others. Um, and it's easy to move around. Um, and I often um, work this way. Just a typical result from doing that type of photography. This is uh, a coastal lichen called Calaplaca flavescens. <clears throat> well, um, the cast on micro. Um, what a change this one component um, made in my higher magnification uh, macro photography. Sure, um, there are other camera uh, or there are other manufacturers that 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 make um, electronic rails. Um, I know that, but in my opinion, having tested a, a stack shot um, against you know the use of the Novaflex um, Castel Micro, which I borrowed initially um, to do a review on. Um, for me, there, there just was no compromise. Um, the electronic rail is such an advantage to have um, in your macro photography, even in low magnification photography. And I want to outline some of the reasons as to why. You can see in a typical setup of mine there, um, I've got the rail, I've, I've got the focusing rail, um, and um, I've got, um, I think it's Ed 7 there, um, and uh, a reversed uh, 24 to 70. Um, and one of the beauty the beauties currently at the moment, um, if you happen to own a Z uh, series camera, Novaflex, as they do for other camera manufacturers, make a reverse adapter, which has complete automation um, and communication with the camera. Um, something which is not currently available if you're using an F-mount um, Nikon system. So this was a big advantage to me as well. But the advantages of using an electron or electronic rail are actually um, quite important. First of all, it's speed. If you have to do a, uh, <clears throat> a focus stack of 60 shots, that means 60 times you have to touch your setup. And it's slow. An electronic rail will do it considerably faster. And you only need to touch it once, and it will carry out the process. You have also precise control over the stepping distance, whereas you don't have that if you're trying to do it manually with the focusing rail by hand. It's got automatic advancement of the camera assembly. Um, some cameras like the D850 and Canons have an inbuilt um, focus stacking um, system there, but it's used in the automatic focus of, of the lens, which can be a bit unpredictable. And I have always found that to be the case, especially when you go on to use it at, at much higher magnifications, which is why I don't, as a rule, um, use it. This is a much more accurate, consistent uh, approach to it. Um, 
you've got obviously when you use an electronic rail you've got reduced artifacts at higher magnifications this is what i find and you have that continuity each time in the results something that you don't always have within camera stacking if you actually look at the picture below um you'll see it's a picture of um a very very tiny flower called a herb robert and these are the stamens um, that i've honed in on um, using an electronic rail i mean they're only no more than three millimeters across so it gives you the idea of um the um control and what you can actually achieve if you switch a lot of your photography to using an electronic rail um <clears throat> These are just some examples um, that I've shot using the Castle Micro. Once I had it, there's a review on my website, um, as there is with some of the other NovaFlex products that I currently own and use. It was a game changer for me. I just had to have it. Um, one of the other things the reel actually does have as well, which other reels do not have. First of all, the NovaFlex reel has the quality of build. And that's very important when you're using it outside um, continually in all sorts of conditions. Um, the Novaflex rail also has a continuous dovetail. So even if you'd not want to use uh, the um, Castel XQ2 rail initially, you can still position, because of the long dovetail on the rail, you can position the focus point almost to where you want it to begin with. That's something that the other rails um, don't have. You tend to have just a very short dovetail. So you don't have that ability to be able to position the rail more or less exactly where you want it to begin with. But I find in my experience of using the rail that um, the quality of the, the stacked images and the, the, the composite outcome were were really amazing and I had so little in terms of artifacts to actually deal with. Um, <clears throat> it's when you go into sort of experiment at much higher magnifications. Now we've got an early purple orchid here. Um, I wanted, if you look at the lower flower, I wanted to go in close here and just have an image of the pollinia, which are incredibly small. And this is where Conventional stacking using a manual approach um, is, is just too difficult and unpredictable. But using the rail and taking 70 or 80 photographs, which it can do in very, very quick uh, succession, you know, succession, you can actually wander off and look for something else while it's doing it. Um, <clears throat> these are the sort of results. Um, and that is one of the reasons why I have switched a lot of my... Um, general focus stack and just to use an electronic rail quite a lot of the time. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of images on the internet um, where photographers use set specimens or specimens that have died um, for high magnification um, macro. Um, <clears throat> I personally don't do that as a rule. Um, I, insects are incredibly difficult to photograph because they're live. And not many will tolerate a rail being pushed in front of them only a few millimeters away. And quite often they move and twitch and it, it can be a frustrating procedure. But every now and again, you will get subjects, particularly like moths, which when they're settled um, and they're not stressed, um, can sit for periods of time. That's again where the electronic rail scores because you can get these types of images relatively um, quickly. Um, when the moth is is settled for a period of time this is a species called manduga sexta and um, <clears throat> this is exactly what what i've done here uh, i think i shot this with the lawa um, 5x macro and um, i when it's possible i have shot a number of different live subjects um, using the electronic rail i shoot lots of static subjects with it um, but i won't kill an insect uh, or anything just um, as a conservationist as well. Um, I, I don't do it. Um, <clears throat> but the detail um, that you can get electronically with so little in terms of having to correct for artifacts, um, to me, is 
one of the fundamental reasons why you should consider uh, an electronic rail. This is the one exception. My, our dog has a habit of nailing every single wasp that comes into the sunroom. And unfortunately, this one met its end. Um, so I actually took advantage um, of this specimen and um, did a focus stack on it. Um, it's about over three times life size. And again, at magnifications, you know, from really to upwards, you really do see the benefits of, of using an electronic rail, um, in my opinion. Um, this is one of the most beautiful um, moths um, in Europe. Uh, it's called the Spanish moon moth. Um, it's uh, named after, I think, Queen Isabella of Spain. Um, and certainly in terms of Saturnids, which, which I mentioned earlier, I don't think there is a prettier one in Europe than this one. It's only found now in a few locations um, in the French Pyrenees and um, in Spain. And I think there's a little population in Switzerland. But the interesting thing about it is when the moth is perfectly at ease, you have the possibility of getting in really, really close, providing you don't touch it um, and looking at a higher magnification on the eye spots. And again, this is shot. These are all shot with the um, electronic rail. Um, and you've got amazing detail. You're three times uh, life size here. And, um, you know, for those photographers out there, who don't own a macro lens, um, it, 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 whether you're a Canon or a Sony shooter or a Nikon shooter, um, you don't need necessarily to own a macro lens to achieve these type of images. You can see here, although I've got the Balef bellows on, but I'm actually using um, the standard 24 to 70 um, kit lens that that comes with an icon z72 it's reversed on the novaflex um, reverse adapter and um, the z lenses are such uh, amazing quality um, I, i've been truly astounded by them um, since i've tested some of them I, I, i've been so impressed um, you can achieve magnifications depending on where you set the focal length easily up to three times life size and and the results are are incredibly sharp um this is just an example of um the stamens um of, of of this bizarrus that um you know that you can achieve the detail um is is quite amazing and that's just from a straightforward 24 70 zoom uh reversed so you can do lots of photography just by um utilizing that one lens um, with you know an electronic rail or if you don't want to use an electronic rail just the reverse adapter and being able to reverse it onto your camera um, you'll get some pretty impressive results and I think more than anyway the the reverse adapters are available for all of the major um, camera systems um, I think that's correct isn't it it is. They are available for all the mirrorless camera systems. We have Nikon Z, we have Canon EOS R, we have Micro Four Thirds, we have Fuji X mount, um, we have L mount, which is um, Leica, Panasonic, and Sigma. And then we have a DSLR system, which is Canon EOS. And unfortunately, not yet for Nikon F mount, as you pointed out earlier. Yes. Um... Since a lot of people are deciding to go mirrorless, um, it's it's a great opportunity and it's a less expensive way of exploring the smaller world um, without having to initially um, spend a lot more money, perhaps on a rail. You can then decide um, what you want to do afterwards. Um, in combination with the bellows, which I've illustrated, uh, gives you absolutely superb um, possibilities um, and lots of uh, room for experimenting um, with with different different subjects. Um, with 
obviously having used the Z9 for quite some time now, um, I also use the Bal F um, bellows, but I also use the Bal Pro uh, One bellows as well, um, particularly when I'm using a heavier system. And in here in this example, I'm using the latest um, 105Z uh, macro lens uh, it's connected sorry, to sorry to interrupt you robert one of our viewers pointed out that i forgot to mention sony e-mount so oh. sorry for all the sony e-mount shooters right yeah well, okay fair enough um <laughs> so <laughs> um sometimes it's difficult to remember everything but um th this yeah. is another this is another setup that i that i like to use um there's excellent working distance with uh the Nikon 105 um, and the Balpro One Bellows is ideally suited to a much heavier setup or to uh, medium format uh, cameras. I think that's where it's ideally um, placed um, for those sorts of cameras. But you can use any camera on it at all. Um, as I say, I use both, um, but I prefer when I'm using heavier setups um, to use the Balpro One. But just to give you some idea of, you know, the level of quality beyond life size with the 105, um, here's the small stamens of a mallow um, captured. And, uh, you, you know, the, the, the lens the lens works superbly at, 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 at magnifications beyond um, one to one. So um, I'm very, very happy with this setup as well. I've tested many different lenses. Um, the beauty about it as well is that you've got total compatibility between um, the camera and the lens, the bellows, everything with that reverse adapter works seamlessly and perfectly. Um, I've had no issues at all whatsoever. And then just scrolling through the last number of uh, images, um, all shot at much higher magnifications, um, utilizing the Castel Micro in the field um it's quick it's it's once you get used to it you can set it up very very quickly in the field i tend to keep the if it's bellows or whether it's the rail um and the focusing rack i tend to keep it all just together in my bag and then when i approach a subject i can just put it all on and in in one click onto uh the, the head and um, it doesn't take that long to line it up and um, I'm using it on battery power um, the um, control unit has a facility for two ba for two batteries and I find that that more than uh, covers a whole day's photography um, and of course you've got that diversity of, of subject slime molds in recent times have become very very popular but again here's where the reel really excels. You're talking about subjects here that are only two millimeters, three millimeters high. Um, and these subjects are best dealt, um, I think, electronically with a reel, and they can be done quite quickly. I also um, use it, as I've said earlier, conventionally as well for some of the lower magnification work. Um, and the reason I do that is in situations where there is a lot of intricate detail. Um, I find that the reel works quickly, but there are less problems with artifacts. And um, when you look at the, the final image here, the composite image, and you look at all of the details in the mosses, um, you quite often sometimes, if you're trying to do it manually, um, by hand through focus advancement, rotation on the lens, um, you um, will quite often see blurred spots and artifacts within, within the detail. Um, you will not find that, um, or I have not experienced that in the same way since I started to use the electronic rail even for a lot of other straightforward um, subjects. Um, the other thing is, um, I think um, when you're this uh, Phaeographus uh, orchid here, where you're trying to um, hold focus from, you know, a near point to quite, you know, a reasonable distance away that is often where the software um, really does show artifacts um, and I've, I've experienced that many times in the past and it's quite time consuming to try and eliminate that um, 
using the rail and maybe using 100 to 120 uh, individual images, it precisely controls everything um, and you get much cleaner, um, better results. Um, you, with the Castle Micro, you have a choice of setting the stepping measurements or you can set the number of photographs and it will automatically calculate the stepping distance. If you want more information, uh, please go to the reviews on my website and you'll find a lot more information in detail um, than I can obviously discuss in the webinar. Um, the other nice thing about focus stacking as well is when you accumulate the images, you can decide where to, to end the depth of field. Um, so in this passion flower, or this passive flora, um, I just kept the stamens in focus and um, stopped it there. But having the ability to keep the whole of the flower in focus uh, isn't a problem. So you can be quite creative for where you want to isolate a particular component uh, from the rest of uh, the subject. And finally, um, you know, um, another uh, situation that I find the real really works incredibly well is when you're photographing frost. Um, this happened to be, um, uh, you know, during the winter, one of the cyclamens, we had a heavy frost. And I mean, just the detail alone that the real will allow you to pick out um, is, I think for me, uh, what makes it an important part. Now in my um, overall um, kit. So don't be afraid to not only experiment with larger magnifications, but um, if you happen to own an electronic rail, um, try using it even at lower magnifications because I think your results will always be that little bit better quite simply because it's controlled. Um, and I think that's one of the most important aspects. You'll have a lot less post um, production um, time uh, involved in producing the composite. So um, thank you you all for um, tuning in. Um, I'm grateful that you have. I hope that um, some of the information that I've passed on um, is, is of use. Um, I know there is a, a, a question and answer session um, and um, I'm happy to answer some of the questions as best I can. And I'm sure Martin will um, fill in any other details that um, I might miss. Well, Robert, first of all, let me say a huge thank you. Thanks for your time and your knowledge. And uh, most importantly, uh, thanks for your friendship because we, we've, we've, yes. uh, we have a very close friendship for, for two years now. We, we have, yes. Um, even in our tastes, as you pointed out, now everybody knows I watch Korean dramas. <laughs> so, um, yes. Um, but I, I would also want to say a big thank you to Noah Flex for not only having um, the faith and allowing me at times to take some of their equipment and utilize it, write about it. Um, that is something that um, I'm extremely grateful for. Um, and at least I get the opportunity to try some of the equipment, um, as they say, before you buy. Well, um, there's a there's a few questions. So if you'd like, um, you can have a glass of water first, <laughs> and then we can uh, go through them. Okay, far away. Okay. <laughs> well, then uh, let's start with uh, Colin. He's asking, how do you retain the color palette in both the subject and purge background so well? Um, I don't, I don't do anything, um, particularly special. Um, to be perfectly honest, I've always found, um, Nikon raw files to be amongst the best. And I think many other photographers, uh, do agree with that. Um, I don't do anything special in Lightroom. Um, I process just in a straightforward way, like, like everybody else does. I tend to shoot, um, the color profile on on my Nikon's is um, neutral. Um, I don't use Vivid. Um, all of what I shoot is shot on neutral. 
um, that's what I uh, what I use. The other thing I should point out as well is I uh, use a fixed color temperature. I never set any of my Nikons on automatic, particularly even when you're focus stacking. That's important because if you're working outdoors um, and your light is changing, your color temperature is going to change as you stack, and that can cause a problem. Therefore, working with a fixed color temperature and presets means that if I'm in a woodland, I have a preset that I've already tested. And if I need to make a global change, everything will be exactly the same. So I don't do anything uh, particularly special to it um, at all. What you see is what there is, basically. Thank you. Uh, there's another question from Dr. Harut from Armenia. Um, he writes, I noticed you're using the bellows in a way when the lens stays at the same place while the body moves back and forth. Is there any specific reason? And I answered, uh, it's mostly about reflection. It does not change yeah. on the subject. Yeah. Uh, anything you would want to add? No, that's, that's more or less it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So does the Castle Microfit standard Arca Swiss plates that it's fully Arca compatible? We yes. can say that. Um, there was another question that you answered throughout your presentation. Do you use Nikon in camera built-in stacking? No, you're working with Castle Micro. <laughs> yes. Um, initially at the beginning I did. Um, but um, the one thing that I find um, I much prefer with with with, with Novaflex software, you can allocate a start and an end position. Um, with the inbuilt focus shifting in Nikon, you can't. You just have to guess. Um, so I much prefer to have a start and an end point, um, and the system works within those those confines. Um, I also can find, you know, autofocus can be a wee bit hit or miss. So I think if you're ser seriously interested to high magnification macro, I think you're much better um, working manually and not using autofocus. I, I'm not sure what your opinion is on that, but that's mine. Thank you. And there's a final question coming in from Andrew. Um, when you shoot reptile images, how do you deal with reflections from glass? Uh, well, first of all, um, I think he's referring to uh, the the tank that you built. Oh yes, right. Well, yeah. Um, if there are any reflections, what I have is I have a large black card, okay, and um, it's attached to a filter. So if I think there's going to be a problem with reflections, I screw that on and uh, that totally, totally neutralizes it. But to be perfectly honest, um, in the vast majority of situations, um, when you hit the subject with flash, it overcomes that problem. Thank you. And another two questions are coming in as we speak. Um, Michael is asking, with the reverse lens, is it open to dust and moisture? And also shooting non-reverse, do you use polarizing filters? Uh, no, I use polarizing filters quite often sometimes in plant photography or in situations where I feel it'll benefit. Um, when I reverse lenses, um, not really dust. I'm, I'm working out in the field. They're, they're tools for a job. Um, I'm reasonably careful, but um, I don't really encounter that much of a problem. If I feel that there is a problem, I just simply wipe it or use a blower brush. Um, sometimes I have little homemade um, hoods that I can position on um, to help. But um, as a rule, it's not something that I can say I've had a huge uh, issue with. Um, be perfectly honest. And the first part of the question, um, is the lens open to dust and moisture when reversed? Um, I can say that uh, the reverse adapters come with a little glass yeah. filter to, to protect uh, yeah. it and to prevent dust and moisture to enter um, the entire setup. 
Okay, and final question from Luis. What is the maximum magnification with the Novoflex bellows in a 105 macro lens when fully extended? Um, you will certainly, um, I've never looked at it in detail, but you will certainly get, um, I would say, with the Bell Pro 1, you'll certainly get up to four times life size. It's uh, three and a half times magnification, if you look up the numbers correct. So. Certainly, I'm close, close to it. Um, yeah, but then if, to it. If, if you have to place an extension tube or anything between that and the camera to get, you'll that, definitely reach four times magnification, yeah, uh, which sometimes you'll have to do depending on which way you're using your bellows. So, I think going through the, the questions, I think. Ah, there's another one coming in. Larry is asking, uh, what stacking software gives you good results? Um, I've only ever, well, I've experimented in the early days with different uh, Zern stacker, and, um, but I, I've used for years Helicon Focus. Um, that's Helicon, what I, so yeah. Helicon Focus? Yes. That's your suggestion. <clears throat> okay, I'll let us switch from the presentation. I think that is it. People are writing super presentation. Thank you very much. Stunning photos, great presentation, excellent and inspirational. So, um, well, Robert, thank you very much again. Uh, I mean, you were showing us the gear that you use and most importantly, um, how to use it. And you seasoned all of this with your amazing images. So once again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thanks very much for um, the invitation to um, speak. Bye. Good night.